Thanks for having me. It's such a densely packed, high value conference. I'm going to share my thoughts on image guided focal therapy for prostate cancer. Important for you to know my disclosures as an investigator on trials in this space and as an advisor and consultant, but equally important, the only company I refer to in this talk is as an unpaid consultant reference to a randomized trial that was done by Steba. This is what I'm going to talk about. Quintessential organ preservation, why you shouldn't immediately dismiss focal therapy, some corollaries with breast cancer, different modalities of focal therapy, what we know about MRI-guided therapy, some data, and what the future might hold. So focal therapy is, in essence, some form of organ preservation. And I feel I'm always obligated to remind people, it might be Captain Obvious, but the best way to preserve your organ is don't do a biopsy and don't treat when you don't need to. So obviously not everyone needs to be screened. Tons of tools available to minimize unnecessary biopsies. Not everyone needs to continue screening and appropriate use of active surveillance. The concept of focal therapy gives people sh certain people shivers and they think it's unimaginable and abject horror. However, progress isn't possible without change, and those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything. The history of medicine is littered with things that had a lot of blowback and a big uphill battle that are now standard of care. We need to evaluate focal therapy for prostate cancer. There are corollaries with breast cancer that are eerily similar. This table will show you how we're about 50 years behind the breast cancer community from radical surgery to RCTs in focal therapy to nowadays when over 50% of women with breast cancer have a lumpectomy as part of their treatment. This didn't happen overnight. There was a revolution and evolution over decades and ultimately multiple randomized trials changed the standard of care. Here's where we are in prostate cancer relatively early in the process. But excitingly, there are data emerging and randomized trials ongoing and being planned. Now, some people would say it's a false analogy. All breast lumpectomy patients get radiation. Prostate cancer is multifocal. Let me show you one of the best known randomized trials in breast cancer. Simply to show you, look to the left here. If you had a lumpectomy, your local recurrence rate was very high, 40%. Might be the same in prostate cancer. If you had local radiation, it lowered that. However, in this initial trial with 20 years follow-up, that local radiation therapy, and even though if you didn't have radiation, your local recurrence rate was high, did not impact metastasis-free survival or overall survival. Subsequently, trials showed a relatively minor advantage to consolidative radiation therapy, and it's now a standard of care. Prostate cancer is multifocal in about two-thirds to up to 85% of patients. Same with breast cancer when you look at mastectomies. What modalities are available for prostate focal therapy? There's a large and expanding list. The two that have been used the longest and perhaps most commonly are cryotherapy and HIFU. But as you all know, there are many others and it's an exciting time. There's a lot of innovation. There's a lot of industry support. And we will ultimately have data. What are the pros and cons of MR-targeted therapy? We have to back up and say, what does MRI provide us? And this conference, obviously, is front and center in discussing it. So we have multiple high-quality trials, randomized and non-randomized, that in general show the use of MRI lowers the number of men who need a biopsy, optimizes detection of grade group two, and lowers the detection of grade group one, triple win. However, as it relates to focal therapy, incredibly important to know that not all prostate cancer is MR visible. This was a great study down out of UCLA where 588 men had an MRI before prostatectomy and had whole mounts. And you can see here in the yellow, there are men with large lesions greater than two centimeters, not detected on MRI. That's 22% of them. High-grade lesions, 
up to a quarter of them not seen on MRI. And if you tried to restrict the criteria to men who might be eligible for focal therapy, 17% of those lesions were missed on MRI. Also, when you're planning any ablative therapy, understand your MRI tends to underestimate the tumor volume, sometimes quite significantly. This study out of UCLA showed the mean tumor size underestimation was about a centimeter, but when you look at volumetrics, it's higher. This figure is somewhat confusing, but as the tumor size on MRI gets larger, that's the x-axis, the y-axis measured the amount of underestimation. And you can see it's the smaller lesions that have the greatest underestimation. Also, MRI, for all of its value, notoriously poor at predicting microscopic extracapsular extension. This was from the National Cancer Institute, a world-class MRI center, and you can see accuracy for ECE suboptimal. Available data, I don't have the time to go through all the comprehensive data we have. I picked three separate modalities. I always start with the most admirable, the company, the sponsor, the investigators, and the men who participated in a randomized trial. This is photodynamic therapy. You get an intravenous photosensitizer and then transperineal laser that activates the photosensitizer. When it was planned 10 years ago, there wasn't an appetite for intermediate risk men, so they appropriately uh, enrolled low risk men. Primary endpoints were very reasonable from a cancer standpoint. And unequivocally, if you had focal therapy, you had a lower likelihood of progression, need for whole gland treatment, and in nearly three times, uh, greater than three times higher likelihood of having a negative biopsy at two years. If you're a man that has to hop on one of these curves, you undoubtedly want to get on the PDT curve. This bore out to four years of follow-up, no matter how you define progression, far lower likelihood of needing whole gland therapy over those four years. What did it do for symptoms? When you looked at the mean there did not appear to be a major difference, although it's important to know that they're always in these trials are a subset of men who do have a meaningful difference that kind of get washed out in the averages. And you can see here about 5% of men had an absolute increase in incontinence, but no major signal or concern. And same goes with erectile function. There is slight worsening with the therapy. So it's not the holy grail of risk-free, no side effects. And you'll see about a quarter of men had an absolute increase in relatively low-grade erectile dysfunction that typically responded to oral therapy. HIFU hemiablation. Tons of data on HIFU. I present one of the best studies, which looked at nine centers in the UK, who admirably enrolled about 85% of their cohort having, quote-unquote, real disease, intermediate or high risk. Debatably, they did allow retreatment with HIFU, where about 20% of the men had repeat HIFU. And if you look out at eight years, we'd all agree that if you haven't had local salvage therapy and you don't have metastasis, something's going okay with your local treatment. Now, there's not a lot of granular data here, but 80% of those men at eight years are still without local salvage therapy or metastasis. Can it cause incontinence? Yes, but really darn rare, 2 to 3% likelihood. IPSS score is pretty similar, but again, when you use box and whisker plots, sometimes it masks a small percentage of men that do have meaningful symptoms. This is from a separate study that was done by Hash Ahmed, where it was well annotated with IPSS scores. Erections, this is from a French study that looked at the data. 95% of the men within three points of their baseline IIEF when you used HIFU hemiablation. And lastly, I bring this up as an innovative therapy with some intriguing, although small cohort data, and that's gold nanoparticle thermotherapy. There's nanoshells that are administered IV. They tend to collect in cancerous tissue. Through a laser, you apply some energy that activates these nanoshells. 16 men with early stage cancer, over half had grade group two. And then thankfully they had rigorous biopsies and MRIs 
two separate times within the first year. And if you look at the rightmost column of the 16 lesions, 14 of the lesions were negative for cancer at one year. Undoubtedly, a lot more follow-up, larger cohorts, more meaningful data, but intriguing nonetheless. Similarly, the box and whisker plots for quality of life look pretty similar over time. We'll need more granular data to really parse this out. The future is really exciting. I'm aware of at least six ongoing and upcoming randomized trials. If you look at clinicaltrials.gov, there's literally hundreds of listings, most single arm. The randomized ones are the ones that are super uh, exciting. Lots of challenges in designing these trials. Having spent a fair amount of time in this space, I won't bore you with the details, but having meaningful endpoints, particularly in conjunction with the FDA for registration, to so go partial versus whole gland ablation, partial versus surveillance, partial versus you know, conventional whole gland therapies like surgery or radiation. And there's pros and cons to each approach. Well, my conclusions are it is absolutely positively worthy of study. I would always favor a patient being in a trial. However, for well-selected, well-informed men, we do offer focal therapy outside of a trial. Selection is critically important for these men to be successful. The clinical trials are ongoing. There's that PDT completed one and lots in the pipeline. And ultimately, data wins the day. Will this be a well-documented, evidence-based uh, option for men? I hope so, but time will tell. Thank you for your time and attention.